Okay, so today's uh, lecture is going to be about uh, the thermodynamics of irreversible processes and everything that I'm going to teach you today may not seem related to steels but how many of you have used Dictra? Yeah, who has used Dictra? Does anybody use Dictra here? The simulation software? I'm surprised. Okay, but you are new students. But uh, Dictra is uh, common in GIFT where you do calculations for multi-component diffusion and diffusional transformations in general. And whenever you're dealing with uh, processes which involve more than one solute diffusing, you need to understand uh, what I'm going to teach you today. And I'll also give you examples in real life where things are not as simple as just looking at one particular process going on at one time. There might be many different processes happening at the same time. Okay. So this will lead on to the next lecture, which will be about, again, ferrite, but in multi-component steels. So today's uh, lecture is about the thermodynamics of irreversible processes. So there's already a couple of terms there which I need to explain to you more, thermodynamics and irreversible. Thermodynamics we normally associate with the equilibrium state. So if you're watching an assembly which is at equilibrium, you don't see any change at all, no matter how long you observe it. Okay? Obviously you've got to observe this on a large enough scale because on a very microscopic scale atoms are changing, moving around but the forward and reverse rates are equal, so macroscopically you do not see any change. So thermodynamics always deals with large numbers of entities, and in our case, atoms. If you observe on a very minute scale, then things are not actually still, they're not static, but there's dynamic equilibrium. But if you observe on a large enough scale, you will not see any change in a system at equilibrium, no matter how long you observe it. So the meaning of thermodynamics okay, deals with equilibrium so quantities such as free energy and entropy do not change as a function of time if you are at equilibrium Therefore, free energy entropy do not change with time. For a system which is at equilibrium, system at equilibrium. Now, normally, we, after thermodynamic calculations, you need to do some kind of a kinetic calculation. And a kinetic calculation is such, uh, a kinetic phenomenon is such that energy is being dissipated. Okay. So I'll write that down and explain it in a bit more detail after that. So in kinetics, energy is dissipated and we need to think about things like thermal conductivity, diffusivity and so on, which don't appear in thermodynamics. So energy is dissipated and terms like conductivity and diffusivity become important. Okay. 
But the important point is that energy is dissipated in the process. So just to illustrate that to you, in terms of an analogy of a ball. Now, this is the state of equilibrium where you have a ball lying inside a valley of some sort, in a, in a trough of some sort. And if I observe that system, I will see no change okay, if, if it is at equilibrium. And this kind of an equilibrium, the first figure here, is stable equilibrium. Now, what's the difference between stable and unstable equilibrium? Yeah. If I disturb this ball with an infinitesimal perturbation, that means the tiniest perturbation, it will come back to its original position, right? Unstable equilibrium is this third figure here, where this is at equilibrium. Okay, I will see no change if I don't disturb it. But if I disturb it, then I will lose my state of equilibrium, that ball will fall, right? So this is unstable equilibrium and this is equilibrium. And this is metastable equilibrium because there might be a deeper trough somewhere else, okay? Now, I cannot actually distinguish metastable equilibrium from equilibrium in real life because we do not know where the minimum will be. And all the laws of thermodynamics are exactly the same for equilibrium and metastable equilibrium, so we don't need to distinguish those states. Except when we know that there is a further minimum and we want to work out the rate at which you go from a metastable state to a stable state. But as far as the laws of thermodynamics are concerned, there is no difference between these two states. So these all describe, can be described by thermodynamics alone. There is no time dependence in these states. On the other hand, this is not at equilibrium. This ball is rolling down a hill, right? That means it's dissipating energy. It's going from a higher free energy state to a lower free energy state. And this is a kinetic phenomenon which will also depend on many other factors, for example, the friction between the ball and the hill, and so on and so on. You cannot describe this purely in terms of thermodynamics. So, in a kinetic process, we are dissipating free energy all the time. Is everyone happy with that? Okay, so now I'm going to show you another slide, which looks a bit more in detail at the kinetic state. So, once again, we have the normal thermodynamics equilibrium state, where there is no energy being dissipated. This is, these two represent cases where energy is being dissipated. In this case, uh, the hill does not have a constant slope, right? So the rate of dissipation is not constant. This is what we call steady state, where the rate of dissipation is constant. So if I'm an observer located on that ball, I will see no change in my environment, right? It's as if nothing is happening. So this is called a steady state process. So another example would be if we have a different temperature outside the room than inside the room, and there's a constant gradient of temperature across that glass, then clearly there is heat flux, right? But if I'm inside the glass, I don't see any change in the temperature gradient. I don't see any change happening, yeah? Because the temperature inside the room and outside is constant. So that's called a steady state process. And it is simpler to deal with than kinetic theory where we don't have steady state. So this is what we are going to focus on today, is steady state processes. So in between uh, the most general form of kinetics and thermodynamics, we have a state which we call, call steady state, where apparently there is no change happening, but energy is being dissipated. Okay. So we have a further state here, which is the steady state, 
where apparently there is no change no change in surroundings but energy is dissipated at a constant rate So everyone clear about the difference between a steady state and general kinetics? Yeah. Now I need to explain to you, uh, first, first of all, let me just write down that supposing we think about a solid and liquid as equilibrium, then it's very easy for us to write an equation that when a solid and liquid are at equilibrium, the free energy of the liquid will be the same as that of the solid, okay, for a pure substance. So for, for a pure substance, a pure substance, solid and liquid are in equilibrium when the free energy of the solid is equal to the free energy of the liquid. Okay? So we have an equation. Whenever we have free energy dissipation, that becomes an inequality. So if I'm below the melting temperature, then Gs is no longer equal to Gl. Yeah. So whenever energy is dissipated this becomes an inequality so that gs does not equal to gl clearly because we are dissipating energy as solidification proceeds. So it becomes much more difficult to define clear laws when we are dealing with kinetic theory, whether it's steady state or non-steady state. We do not have equalities, we have inequalities to deal with. Okay, now I need to define for you what I mean by a reversible process and an irreversible process. So again, I'm going to use uh, a mechanical anal analogy, uh, and I'll begin by defining the process and then explaining it. So a reversible process is one in which when I change the direction of the process uh, by a very small amount, an infinitesimal change in external conditions, and then I remove that change then I will go back to the original state without dissipating any energy. So that's quite uh, uh, a lot to swallow immediately, but if I show you this graph, uh, this slide, it will become very clear. So imagine that we have a piston which is moving inside a cylinder, right? Uh, and we've got uh, an ideal gas inside the cylinder. An ideal gas means PV equals NRT the relationship between pressure, volume, and temperature. Uh, there is no friction at all between this piston and the cylinder. So if I start, say, at this point here, and I change the pressure so that I move along this point, and then I change the pressure back, then I come back exactly along that curve. Okay, There is no friction here, and this is an ideal gas. 
So if I, come, if I follow that curve exactly, then I'm not dissipating any energy. Okay? So this is called an irreversible process. So it's a process whose direction can be changed by an infinitesimal change in external conditions because there is no friction here. Okay? And friction dissipates energy. So an irreversible process, uh, a reversible process, process, uh, an infinitesimal change in conditions can be reversed <coughs> without dissipation of energy. The analogy we used was that of a frictionless piston in a cylinder containing an ideal gas. Now, if I contrast that with a process which is irreversible, then it is a process which dissipates energy and is irreversible to an infinitesimal change in external conditions. So now if I introduce friction here, then in order to alter the pressure from here, uh, alter the pressure, I will get no change in volume at first because the movement of the friction, uh, of the piston is opposed by friction, right? So I raise the pressure but nothing happens because I've got friction between the piston and the cylinder. And then when you overcome the friction, you move along this curve. If I now let go of the pressure, then nothing happens until I drop the pressure to this point because we have friction in the opposite direction, right? And you follow this curve until you come back to here. Now, can somebody tell me what is the energy dissipated in this process? Yeah. It's due to friction, but uh, on that diagram, what is it? Is, is this area. So clearly, this is not a reversible process because if I change my pressure by an infinitesimal amount, nothing happens because I've got friction there. Okay? So an irreversible process dissipates energy. is associated with dissipation of energy. It doesn't mean that you can't reverse the process. It simply means you have to spend energy in order to reverse the process, right? Okay, uh, we are going to deal with processes which are dissipating energy, okay? Because that's uh, moving away now from thermodynamics towards kinetics, but we are going to stick to the steady state. That means we are dissipating energy at a constant rate. So I'm going to introduce you to a particular law which applies to irreversible processes and then I will derive it for you, okay? Uh, derive it approximately for you because everything becomes approximate when we go away from thermodynamics. Okay, so just pay attention, don't worry about this. Uh, very, very simple equation but extremely powerful that if I have a flux, now 
normally are used to fluxes in terms of say the diffusion flux or the heat flux but this is a general flux which also applies to diffusion or heat but it could be anything it could be an electrical current for example okay so this is a generalized flux and there's something driving that flux and that we call a force right so a generalized force so for example in the case of diffusion it might be some sort of a gradient yep. uh, and in the case of current it might be some sort of a gradient of potential so this is a generalized flux and this is a generalized force if I multiply the two I will get the rate at which energy is dissipated which is the temperature multiplied by the rate of entropy production you know that if I multiply temperature by entropy then I get an energy right is everyone familiar with that so Sigma here is not the entropy but is the rate of entropy production so that temperature times that is the rate of energy dissipation and that is equal to a flux times a force Now, so we have uh, temperature times the rate of entropy production of entropy production. is equal to a flux which we'll call J multiplied by a force which we will call capital X now if I can write any process in this way then I'm going to say that J will be proportional to X so if I can express I can express any process using such an equation then I will find that the flux is proportional to the force can you give me an example let's think about diffusion what is the flux It's the, it's the mass flowing through a unit area in a unit time, isn't it? Yeah? And what is the force? Yeah, you, are, you know, you are very good. Huh? Okay, so I thought you had it right when you said potential gradient, uh, but then you changed your mind to concentration gradient. So that isn't correct, okay? concentration gradient strictly does not drive diffusion do you know that what drives diffusion hmm? uh, yeah so you're getting nearer the answer it's not quite activity chemical potential gradient okay so chemical potential is a free energy right so if you have a gradient of free energy and you multiply it by the flux you get the rate of energy dissipation right so in the context of diffusion uh, the J would represent the diffusion flux so for example J is a diffusion flux then X would be a chemical potential gradient so it's uh, d mu by dz where mu is the chemical potential 
So if I take the product of the flux and the free energy gradient, then I get the rate of energy dissipation, right? Any other example? So, of course, this is known as uh, 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 the generalized fixed law of diffusion, yeah? That flux is proportional to a chemical potential gradient, fixed it according to the concentration gradient, but more generally, it's the chemical potential gradient, yeah? So this is, if you like, this is a derivation of Fix's law of diffusion from irreversible thermodynamics. Can you give me another example where you find the flux to be proportional to the force? So is there any electrical engineer here? Yeah. Relative fields can make the proportional to the force Okay. Uh, you are right, but there is a complication with magnetic fields, which I will come to later. Yeah. Okay. But give me another example from electrical engineering, where a flux is proportional to a force. Think. Uh, don't think about flux as a flux, mm -hmm. but any, anything. Yeah, electrical current is proportional to? Yeah, voltage or electromotive force. And what is the law describing the relationship between current and Ohm's law? So we have current being proportional to voltage, right? So in, in the case of um, electrical conduction, so current equal to the flux and electromotive force voltage difference force which is known as EMF right we will call the force and Ohm's law says that the current is proportional to the voltage, right? Now, what happens when I multiply current by voltage? Sorry? Hmm? Yeah, so what is power? What's the difference between power and energy? Yeah, so current uh, times voltage gives you energy per unit time, right? So rate of energy dissipation. So you see, if you had known this equation here, and I haven't proven to you that if you follow that equation then J will be proportional to X, then you could derive Ohm's law. Is, is there any other law? Where did uh, where did Fix's law? What preceded Fix's law of mass diffusion? What came before that? How about Fourier's law? Do you know Fourier's law of heat diffusion? Yeah. So there, the flux of heat is proportional to the gradient of temperature. Same thing. If I multiply the two, I will get the rate of energy dissipation, right? Everyone happy so far? So, I haven't explained to you the basis of what we are doing, but if you assume what I've said here, that T times the rate of entropy production equals J, uh, which is a flux, times the force X, if I can write an equation like that, then I will find that J is proportional to X. Okay? Force is proportional to flux. So everyone happy with that so far? Okay. Right, let me see where we are, where are we? Okay, so here is our Ohm's law where you have uh, the voltage equals current. Oops, it is it equals current times the electrical resistance. 
And if I take the product of current and voltage, I get the rate of energy dissipation, which is T times sigma, temperature times the rate of entropy production. Okay. Now I'm going to try and show you why J is proportional to X and also when that approximation fails. Okay? So we need to now demonstrate that the force and flux are proportional. Okay. So uh, let us prove and I'll put proof in inverted commas, okay? Because it's not really a proof that J is proportional to X when T sigma is equal to J X. So I'm going to write an expansion of the flux in terms of the force using a Taylor series, okay? Uh, about a force equal to zero. So we write a Taylor expansion of J about X is equal to zero. So, so when I use the uh, braces like this, I, I, I mean that J is a function of the force, okay? Not that J is multiplied by X. In other words, here I'm implying that J a function of X. Well, the first term here will be J of zero. And the second term will be J dashed of zero, the first derivative, and multiplied by X over one factorial, okay? And the third term will be J double dashed of X, oh, of zero, sorry and x squared over 2 factorial. Correct, yeah. Right? So it's just a Taylor expansion and I can continue this uh, for any number of terms. Can you help simplify this? Is there any term that I can delete there? Hmm? Yeah, correct. So the first term, j of 0, we can delete. Why is that? You're right. Why can I delete it? j of 0 means the flux when the force is 0. So what will that be? 0. There's no flux if there's no force, right? So. can delete the first term. Now, supposing that we are deviating only slightly from zero, yeah, mm -hmm. that means the magnitude of the force is small, then is there any other term that I can get rid of? So if x is small, which terms can I ignore? Hmm? X squared and higher order terms because a small number squared will be even smaller, right? So I can delete this second term. And what do I recover? I recover that the force J is proportional to X. Okay, so therefore J is approximately proportional 
to x, right? Here, j is proportional to x. Right, so what does this mean for Ohm's law, for Fick's law, Fourier's law? This is quite straightforward, the deletion of the first term, right? But what, what does this mean when we delete the higher order terms? What should you expect if I make the voltage difference extremely large? It may not be the case that the current will be proportional to the voltage, right? Now it's very difficult or even maybe impossible to do such an experiment because as soon as you apply a very large voltage difference you get a lot of heat generated. Yeah? But in the case of diffusion we can actually apply very large gradients of concentration by depositing say for example one layer of gold on top of one layer of silver that's the biggest gradient that you could get, right? And in those circumstances your diffusion law will no longer have a constant mobility. You know, mobility is related to diffusion coefficient. Yeah? The diffusion coefficient itself becomes a function of the gradient. Right? So there will be a point where these linear laws will break down. I cannot tell you at what point they will break down. Okay? But have you heard of spinodal decomposition? Yeah, has anybody heard of spinodal decomposition? So where you have a solution which is such that if you give it a small perturbation it will tend to break down into solute rich and solute poor regions and the gradients of concentration can be very large and you can no longer use ordinary diffusion theory for that. You have to take account of uh, effectively the dependence of the diffusion coefficient on the gradient itself. Okay? So there will be a point where the thermodynamics of irreversible processes no longer applies. Yeah. Now there is another law which we can think about which is that the velocity of a boundary will depend on the driving force. Yeah? That's quite sensible that the velocity of a boundary, if you increase the driving force it will go faster and if I multiply the velocity by uh, uh, velocity of the boundary by the driving force I get the rate at which energy is dissipated, right? So again we should be able to write uh, using uh, our so consider actually I'll go to a fresh page because I need to draw a diagram, okay? So here we have a coordinate Z and this is uh, energy and this is uh, the position of the oops this is the driving force which we'll label as delta G and this here is the activation barrier so it's Q so Q is an activation barrier for the transfer of atoms from one side of the interface to the other it's an activation barrier for transfer of atoms from one side of interface to the other. I mean normally write the velocity is proportional to delta G where V is the velocity of the boundary. <coughs> 
if I multiply velocity by delta G, then I will get the rate of energy dissipation, which is T sigma. So this is just like Ohm's law and Fick's law and so forth. But I want to derive the equation for the velocity of a grain boundary a bit more carefully. Okay? And what I'll do is I'll look at the rate at which atoms jump from one side of the barrier to the other and in the reverse direction. So the rate at which the atoms will jump from the left-hand side of the barrier to the right-hand side, okay? So the rate from left to right will be proportional to exponential minus q over kt. Yeah. That's just the Arrhenius equation. Yeah. And there'll be a frequency factor in front of this. So um, let's call that small omega, which is a frequency factor. Frequency of attempts. The exponential term gives you the probability of a successful jump, and omega is how many times you are attempting. So omega times exponential is the rate of successful jumps. Yep. Now, in the reverse direction, so the rate in the reverse direction, from right to left, will be proportional to omega times exponential minus q plus delta g upon kt because the barrier for going in that direction is larger. Yeah. You know, if I, if I want to go from this lower energy state to the higher energy state, I've got to jump a barrier which is delta G plus Q, right? So the net rate will be proportional to the velocity. So I write the velocity is the difference between the forward and the reverse jumps. So I will simplify this by taking exponential minus q upon kt common. So it's 1 minus exponential oops, of delta g upon kt. Yes, simply the forward rate minus the reverse rate. Yeah. So actually this is not velocity equal to, but velocity proportional to. Because I've ignored the um, frequency factors, etc. Now, this does not look like velocity being proportional to delta G, right? Which we get from the force times flux equation. Looks quite different, doesn't it? Well, if you make delta G small, you know, if you expand exponential when delta G is small, you will recover velocity being proportional to delta G. So can you do that for yourself? Okay. So for small delta G, oops, small delta G, this becomes velocity is proportional to delta G. So you have to decide by experiment, okay? There's no way of predicting at what point that proportionality fails. Yeah? You have to decide by experiment how far you can go with the theory that we've explained so far. I cannot tell you that, you know, when the velocity becomes this much, you cannot use that relationship. Only experiment can tell you that, okay? Okay. 
Is everyone happy with that so far? Okay, this was our electrical example. This is the Taylor expansion that we did, where uh, J of zero, we can delete because there's no flux when there is no force. And we can also delete higher order terms as a first approximation. But if you are going to use very large forces, then you might need to take account of additional terms. Uh, same thing applies to Fourier's law of heat diffusion where the product of the heat flux with the gradient will give you the rate of energy dissipation and you find that the heat flux is proportional to the gradient. And in the case of diffusion, uh, Fix's law of diffusion is just an empirical law where the flux is expressed as a function of the concentration gradient, but that's not too rigorous. We really need to express the flux in terms of the chemical potential gradient. Okay, And then when you multiply the flux by the chemical potential gradient, we'll get the rate of energy dissipation. So this is, this is uh, just as a side, side issue. If you compare these two equations, then you can define the concentration dependence of the diffusion coefficient just by comparing the terms. Uh, this is the reason why the diffusion uh, coefficient depends on concentration. Okay. When you make the chemical potential gradient very large, it also becomes a function of the gradient itself. <coughs> and just to summarize, uh, the different forces and the fluxes, so we have the electromotive force being proportional to electrical current, the temperature gradient being proportional to the heat, uh, oh, sorry, heat flux being proportional to the temperature gradient, diffusion flux to the chemical potential gradient, and in some cases, the stress is proportional to the strain rate. If you multiply stress by strain rate, you get, what do you get if I multiply stress by strain rate? Rate of energy dissipation. Right? You know, stress has the units of energy per unit volume, exactly the same as megapascals or pascals. Yeah? Energy per unit volume multiplied by a strain rate, which is per time, gives you energy dissipation per unit time. Okay, now comes the really clever step, which is very, very simple. Okay? That supposing we have a temperature gradient and a concentration gradient, right? A temperature gradient can drive diffusion, just like a concentration gradient can. But supposing we have both of them happening at the same time, how do we deal with that? Well, the equation that we had still applies, that the total rate of energy dissipation is a sum of the dissipations due to each of the processes. That means J of I, X of I. You know, you have several different processes. So if I can write that equation, then I can also write that the flux will be proportional to its own force, but will also depend on other forces. So the diffusion flux will depend not only on the chemical potential gradient, but also on the temperature gradient. Right? So let me just write that down. So for multiple forces, for multiple forces, and fluxes, We can still write that temperature times rate of entropy production is a sum of all the different dissipations going on. And therefore, just like we did for a single force and a flux, 
Therefore, we'll get j of i is equal to And let, let's, uh, let me expand that a little bit. So supposing we have two forces and fluxes, then I can write J of 1 is equal to M1, oops, 1, 1 times X1 plus M1, 2 times X2, okay? That means that my flux will depend not only on the force due to X1, but also x2. So if I have a concentration gradient and a temperature gradient, then my diffusion of manganese will depend on both. Yeah? Now, there's a real-life example of this that you use all the time, but you haven't realized it. Your thermocouple. Yeah? When you measure a temperature difference between a reference and your sample, actually creates a voltage, doesn't it? Yeah. So a temperature gradient is creating a voltage. Yeah. What is the opposite of that effect? So we have a temperature gradient creating a voltage. Is there any device which does the opposite? That we have a voltage difference which creates a temperature difference? Yeah, you know, you, you can, uh, you, in, in, in uh, Korea, you have every kind of gadget you can buy in the world, yeah? You can buy a refrigerator for cooling one Coke can, right? Have you, have you ever come across that? And it has no moving parts. How does that work? The Peltier effect, yeah? If I apply a voltage difference, I'll create a temperature difference, and that's your solid state refrigerator. So a flux need not depend only on the single force. If you have several forces happening at the same time, then they will influence the flux. So if you think about multi-component diffusion, which is what we are after, uh, I'll, I'll just write down the second one here, which is J2 is equal to M21 into X1 plus M22 into X2. Assuming we have two forces and two fluxes. Now, if, if we are close to equilibrium, then the forward and reverse rates of reactions must be equal, and that requires that M12 must be equal to M21. So, a gen general principle is that, in general, M12 will be equal to M21, except in the case of magnetic fields, yeah? Except for magnetic fields, where M12 equals minus M21. Now, the reason why I went through all this is you really need to understand what goes into all the calculations that we do for multi-component diffusion. And I can write now with considerable confidence that you'll understand if I write that the flux of carbon is equal to um, and I'm going to assume fixes ordinary law of diffusion here. The diffusion coefficient of carbon um, times the gradient of carbon, okay? Gradient of manganese. So the flux of carbon will not just depend on the gradient of carbon, but also on the gradient of manganese. Yeah. And this is called a cross diffusion coefficient. That means the dependence of the diffusion of carbon on the gradient of manganese. So if I have an alloy which contains segregation of manganese, okay, 
So there's a different manganese concentration here from here. And I start with a uniform concentration of carbon. The carbon will redistribute, even though there was no originally original gradient of carbon. Yeah? So the carbon will migrate. And similarly, you can write um, that the flux of manganese, oops, will be minus gradient of manganese. Yeah. Now manganese is a large atom, carbon is a small atom, so manganese flux is not going to be influenced greatly by gradients of carbon, but on carbon there will be a big effect if there is a gradient of manganese. Okay? So if I, if I write an equation like this, you are now completely comfortable because you know where it comes from, right? So this is just the expansion of the equation, uh, which I already wrote down on the board. And in general, you'll find Mij equals Mji, but in the case of magnetic fields, we have a minus sign there. Okay? So I think you've learned quite a powerful principle today, which is useful not just in what we are going to do, but in many different aspects of phase transformations and even processing of materials. Okay? So that's all for today. Thank you.